for those of you that haven't been with us before, um, a, very much a conversational short webinar um, to an opportunity to really reflect on topical issues around food policy. Um, and I'm really, really thrilled that Tim uh, Benton is with us today. Uh, I'm sure many of you know him. He's uh, the research director at Chatham House and has been a real um, national and global expert around issues on food security for a number of years. Um, so we're going to be delving into some of the um, topical issues um, with him. And I think when we started to sort of prepare for today's conversation, I was struck we were reflecting really on the last 10 days. And there has been, I think, probably about 10 important news stories around food policy, which have emerged over the last 10 days. So we're going to have a chat about those. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to get started with the first question, which I'm going to put to you first, Tim, and I want to hear your thoughts, and then I'll tell you mine, is around tomatoes. I mean, it's obviously not just tomatoes that we've got this new story around, but let's take them as being indicative of the bigger issue. Should we actually be expecting to have fresh tomatoes on the shelves of supermarkets in February. It's triggered a big conversation to raise copies, conversation, you know, points and all of this. But what, let's start off with that question. What do you think? Um, so I'm gonna sit on the fence here and say, it depends. So kind of in, in an ideal world, if we are producing food sustainably and if we are producing enough fruit and vegetables on a global basis using uh, the land in the right places uh, to grow food uh, with the least environmental costs, then trade should allow us to e uh, eat food wherever it's produced in whatever season it's produced without an uh, untoward environmental cost. The issue is if that's not the case. So oh, at the moment, and I think we'll touch on it again later, we clearly have uh, a period of prolonged disruption of our food system, and that affects our food security in the UK. And the answer to the question then depends on what is the balance of the costs versus the benefits of producing more food locally, or paying more for food produced overseas, or having cheaper and more available food that's produced overseas and comes with an environmental cost. So we can never be self-sufficient for food in the UK. We have to import some stuff. And if that stuff is importable, great if it comes at a low cost. If it means that we we are paying a very large environmental cost or a big social cost or a big water cost overseas and bringing unseasonal fruit and vegetables to the UK, then perhaps no is the answer. But we do need to bear in mind, as you know so well, that we uh, have to encourage people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And uh, whilst our esteemed Secretary of State says, well, let everybody eat turnips, um, <laughs> there is an issue that turnips are not quite as palatable and not quite as useful in many regards than tomatoes. So uh, I think it's, it's the duty of those in charge of our food system to get the incentives right, that we can import sufficient fruit and vegetables so that they're available for people but it has to be done in exactly the right way and just eating root vegetables which is what we're very good at producing is not really the answer although as we will come to that balance of what we produce locally and what we import is a real question that we need to tackle and we haven't tackled because we just left it to the market so far yeah so I mean, that raises a bunch of questions, a bunch of sort of thoughts, I suppose, in my mind. Um, I mean, I agree with you in the context of where we're all uh, trying to encourage people to eat more fruit and veg for all the environmental and health benefits that that potentially brings, particularly the health benefits. Um, it did seem extraordinary to see those headlines saying, I think it were four or five supermarkets that were going to limit the amount that you could buy. And obviously they were mm. doing so in order to avoid probably weren't really thinking about your average customer but really people buying for restaurants and other sort of sources uh, of la larger scale purchasing but still it felt a little bit odd um I'm interested though in your points because I think there's a very specific set of conversations around fruit and veg in relation to this issue of national food security because of the perishability at least of fresh produce and 
the the implications that that has for how much we think we should be growing in the UK. And if we look at our fruit and veg, the sort of terms of trade across different categories of foods or the balance of trade um, across it, we obviously have quite low levels of UK production of our fruit and veg supply. So um, we produce about 35% of the fruit and veg that we actually eat, we produce in the UK. And so we have quite a big trade deficit, much bigger than for any for other categories of of food and um and defra did announce back when it did its response to the national food strategy that it was going to develop a horticulture plan for england um which in our view is really long overdue i mean it goes to your point of setting out with a deliberate sort of purpose here about well really thinking about how much fruit and veg should we be producing in the uk and we did some work back in oh, several years ago now uh, where we published a report called Farming for Five a Day, where we actually went fruit and veg by literally through the list of the, the, the largest fruit and veg that we eat. Uh, sorry, I've said that wrongly, but the ones with the highest, uh, the highest volume that we eat of, I think it was the top 100 fruit and veg. And there were a good number of them that we could be producing more in the UK of within our climate limitations um and in fact where um with the right incentives for farmers we could yeah increase um uh, sort of harvest periods and you know extend the growing season and that kind of thing um so um yeah it feels to me that it's a big opportunity on the horticulture in particular to grapple with this issue and i wonder to what extent this tomato issue is going to trigger some of those conversations in government um well i hope so i mean I, I think i'm giving evidence to house of lords select committee on horticulture in a couple of weeks time to talk about this this very question um but when i spoke about this at the nfu conference the other day last week or whenever it was the uh vice president who interviewed me on stage afterwards his first comment was well we don't have enough water uh and if we're going to grow more fruit and vegetables in a changing climate uh, where does the water come from? And then there's also the issue clearly that something like tomatoes, I mean, if you go down, and I'm sure you have, to uh, Thanet Earth and see the enormous greenhouses down there, they are placed in Kent because that's the sunniest part of the country. And if you're going to place a big greenhouse facility up in Scotland, you would need to heat it. And then it comes with an energetic cost uh, when we are energy insecure at the same time. So across all of these things, there is a balance of risks and benefits. You know, my own personal view, I wrote a report on British food years ago, um, five or six years ago, saying that from a security perspective, we need to get that balance better. And, you know, the, the item in the news this week about the Kent apple orchards being grubbed up, you know, I first started getting interested in agriculture in the late 80s, early 90s, where that was happening all across the south of England. And it's crazy in the world we're in that we are just offshoring all of our production when we could very well produce it here. But it requires that deliberative strategy mm. because the market at the moment will not reward farmers doing it and the resources that are required will need planning and their impacts will need um, uh, mitigating. But the fundamental point, as you have said, and I have said, is that we need to uh, have access to more fruit and vegetables and preferably more fruit and vegetables locally grown. But they do that does come with an opportunity cost that needs the incentive structure, the strategy to be worked out, which is, I guess, a government mm -hmm. issue. And the question is, how much does our government want to grapple with it? And the, at the moment, the answer, according to Therese Coffey's um, response the other day, was no, we don't want to deal with it. We leave it to the market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, very good point. And I think, um, I mean, in relation to that um, and the horticulture plan, which the government is now, well, at least on paper, progressing, um, we're really hoping that they're not just going to be looking at um, sort of narrow focus on production or even just high tech production, vertical farming, hydroponics, et cetera. But also thinking about, as you say, if we're going to really um, invest in British horticulture, how does that go hand in hand with 
the cons- the thought about consumption because there's no point in growing more UK veg if we're not actually ultimately going to eat more. So how do we use this opportunity to not just build the resilience of the supply chain, but also increase kind of consumer engagement with the whole kind of idea of eating more fruit and veg? And what does that mean that all the other bits of the supply chain need to do to, to help consumers get there, citizens get there? Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, no I mean... Uh... Just briefly on the, the latter point, I think that's a, a really uh, key issue because there's no point in us growing more fruit and vegetables and that, then exporting it or wasting it. But the overall issue of trying to encourage people to eat more fruit and vegetables and with a preference for locally produced seasonal vegetables is probably the, the best of all worlds. But, mm-hmm. but as, a, as I say, that requires st- strategy and incentives and market changes to allow that to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we're going to move on slightly. So we covered two two news stories. Uh, well, three actually, really. The tomato shortage um, we touched on Turnip Gate, as we called it here in the Food Foundation, with Trace Coffee's comments, and the apple orchards um, being grabbed up. We're moving on now to a different, slightly different theme. Um, so you mentioned that you were at the NFU conference. So was the leader of the, leader of the Labour Party, as well as two uh, DEFRA ministers, Trace Coffee. Um, and Mark Spencer. Um, Now, Keir Starmer, in his comments, said that food security is national security. Um, So it's quite an interesting framing. I'd be really interested to know what you think about that. Do you agree? You're obviously, you've given this loads of thoughts. And um, (laughs) yeah, tell me what you think. Yeah, well, that's why it's called food security, because it is about you know, if you think about the priorities for people, food and energy and a place to live and all of the kind of standard human rights, ensuring that the that, that, that the country has those access to resources uh, actually is national security. And if you think back, I mean, you're far too young, and so am I, to remember it, but the rationale for our paying subsidies to farmers as opposed to Um, any other industry is based on food security being a national security issue and that's the 1947 Agriculture Act that you know we're still kind of toying with the the uh, grandsons and granddaughters of that so you know it's really come to the fore in the last year with the invasion of Ukraine and the price spike that for many countries and I think including our own but not in the way that DEFRA will, would would necessarily uh, fr- frame it, that food security cannot be left to the markets because if you rely a lot on imported food because you're not producing the right sorts of stuff at home and something goes wrong, whether it's a war or whether it's a climate impact or whatever, your supply chains will break. And, you know, Tomato Gate is an example of that in a small scale and some of the issues to do with our post-COVID food uh, 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 disruptions is another example of that. So the the issue is, from a strategic perspective, if the world is calm, uh, it makes sense to grow what we're really good at growing and export it, uh, and then buy in what we're not growing. If the world is not calm, that comes with a very big risk because you know, your national security is at risk. So there isn't a kind of any strong argument for saying we should be trying to be self-sufficient, but somewhere between export, you know, growing everything as an export economy and importing a lot and trying to be self-sufficient, somewhere between those two extremes is a kind of sweet spot where it minimizes the risks from a national security, food security perspective, uh, but it also maximizes the ability of the market to uh, create food for the, at the right sorts of prices for, for everybody to, to access. But it does need a strategic approach. And our current uh, government's uh, view of food security is largely, we are a rich country, so uh, availability won't be an issue because we can always pour, pay more for food, which itself begs the question that we'll probably come on to in a minute. Um, uh, and we don't have to worry about strategically changing what we are growing in the UK because it's the problem for the market to solve. So we'll never starve in the UK, although so some people obviously are. Um, uh, 
and we can just outcompete any African country in the global market if we want to import food that becomes pricey. So the government's food security strategy, leaving it to the market largely, means that we expose uh, people on marginal incomes, which is a bigger proportion of the population than it should be. We expose people on marginal incomes to cost of living crisis and food insecurity because of the cost of food. Whereas the a better answer might be to do more deliberatively about making sure that we are growing sufficient fruit and vegetables, that these supply chain issues have less consequence. And, you know, Tomato Gate this year is only one of a stream of interruptions to our food supply over the last decade. We had Avocado Gate a few years ago and we had Lettuce Gate and, you know, a whole range of uh, different interruptions, plus all of the the, the stuff around the disruption post-COVID, during COVID, the disruptions of the food price spikes in 2007-8 uh, and last year and so on. So we ought to be collectively working much more towards having a proper deliberative look at this question. What should mm -hmm. we be growing? How much should it be? And that requires a long-term vision and that requires choice Um not just saying it's not our problem, it's the market problem. Uh, and uh, Keir Starmer's speech, whilst it wasn't as bold as I think it should be, at least there was a degree of long-term thinking in his comments about where agriculture fits into uh, the the UK economy and UK social issues in a way that, that was very uh, missing from the Secretary of State's speech. Yeah. Um, so I think this point that you said about, um, you know, these shocks are here to stay and we really need to be, yeah, factoring in our planning in recognition that the intensity and frequency of shocks, we know from all the climate change projections that this is how life is going to be. Um, and the, the, when we're thinking about the resilience of our supply chains, thinking alongside that about the resilience of people in Britain, citizens, households, to be able to actually cope with this level of fluctuation in prices has to be also kind of part, part of the mix. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see whether there's sort of starting to see some signs that the environment movement are thinking about sort of resilience in those terms from a sort of citizen level as well as at the at the national level which i think i think is um quite interesting in relation to the bro the broader points that you're you're setting out uh, do you think we should be setting sort of thresholds below which our f levels of food insecurity or our levels of um uh self sufficiency don't don't fall I mean I, obviously there are problems with setting sort of targets for because we know that that creates you know can create a lot of perverse incentives and you know um environmental damage um but should we be thinking about it differently and saying well actually we're going to be worried if our um self-sufficiency in fruit and veg or our self-sufficiency in uh, meat and dairy fall below certain levels because of the risks that that will expose us to? Um, no, I think we need a more new, nuanced response because, you know, if we are going to go to, say, 50% self-sufficiency in fruit and vegetables, that will be predominantly fruit, uh, root vegetables because that's what we're good at and perhaps some um, pears and apples uh, and top fruits like that I, I and so obviously it also depends on storage and seasonality and so on you know achieving self-sufficiency in fruit and vegetables is easy in the summer or easier in the summer than it is in the winter so mm -hmm. we will still need some degree of trade but I think when it comes to building resilience I mean resilience has a range of properties there's diversity in the sense of the diversity of production, but also di diversity of supply routes and diversity of port infrastructure and so on. There's redundancy, which might be food stores in the UK, or uh, or it might be encouraging people to have bigger food cupboards at home uh, in whatever way that that can be economically incentivized. Uh, there is modularity or decentralization, which is not having everything that comes 
into the country going to a single processing center or something like that but having locally resilient food networks mm -hmm. rather than one big central distribution center and then there's also agility flexibility substitutability so if you can't get a tomato what else can you get instead and are consumers uh, at the point of sale willing to switch and then that kind of thinking that uh, from a kind of consumer perspective um, uh, uh, and uh, to a certain extent, a citizen perspective, that kind of thinking that I'll go into the supermarket and see what's available from a seasonality, supply chain, environmental perspective, and choose amongst that rather than expect to see exactly the same things on the shelves all the year round. And that goes back to your kind of question one. In an ideal world, that's possible, but we're not in an ideal world. So we need to build in resilience. And it's not just about what do we produce, but it's also the, all of these other things around mm. redundancy and diversity and uh, substitutability and so on. Buffers in the system, yeah. Okay, interesting. The other related story that came out in the last 10 days to this point is um, a story that came out from the Netherlands, um, specifically looking at... Um, they're moving in the sort of direction of setting out as quite an ambitious plan for growing plant-based protein in the Netherlands to reduce their reliance on soy um, uh, and to feed into the sort of plant-based diets direction of, trans of dietary transition. I thought it was quite interesting that they um, were setting out their stall in those terms. Obviously, as you mentioned earlier, um, they're not alone. Um, did you uh, what what did you take from that? So uh, if you look across Europe, including in the UK, there's quite a lot of investment in growing more legumes for a variety of reasons, not just the plant based diet, but also reducing cattle feed or livestock feed in general. Um, the challenge that the industry says is that nobody wants to eat lentils. They'd much rather eat other things. And so there are issues to do with how you turn lentils into human or pulses in general into human ready food that doesn't have wind problems or taste problems or some of the secondary the, the metabolites within the, 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 the beans that might um, have adverse health impacts. So it's a kind of broader question, but lots of countries are saying, how do we reduce our reliance on overseas supply chains and part of that is from a security perspective and uh, part of that is from a local income perspective for farmers part of that is from a health perspective in terms of plant-based uh, uh, proteins and part of that's from an environmental perspective uh, in the sense that you know uh, so the soy supply chain is associated with a lot of decarb uh, deforestation mm -hmm. in, in latin america but then again uh, our ability because of comparative advantage our ability to grow lent uh, um, pulses in the Netherlands or Sweden or whatever also comes with an environmental footprint which is a different environmental footprint and perhaps on a global basis less harmful but it might be also more polluting because of greater nitrogen uh, and greater pesticide requirements or, or other things like that so again there isn't a simple and straightforward answer that it's always a good thing it's got to be done within the broader strategic framework of what is the government vision for a food system that is sustainable and health providing and gives an income to farmers? Mm -hmm. And how does that fit, fit in with a land use strategy, within a net zero strategy, within a health strategy, preventative healthcare, et cetera? And at the moment, no government is really putting all of those pieces together and coming up with a what I would call a truly strategic plan for where agriculture should go. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, let's move on to the last question. So this scoops up um, uh, a number of stories which are related to sort of affordability of food, food insecurity at household level, what children are eating in Britain today. Um, we've got so five stories which we've scooped, we're going to scoop up here. So first is the Sadiq Khan announcement to extend free school meals to um, all children in primary school in London from September for a year. Uh, that was actually quickly followed by, if those of you didn't spot it, Camden, Borough and Southwark, both making longer term commitments. So Camden saying they're going to stick with that in the long term. Southwark saying, well, that will save us some money. So we're going to extend free school meals into secondary schools. All really exciting commitments. Um, 
We had yesterday Lee Anderson MP uh, leading a debate in, in Parliament about um, affordability of nutritious diets and giving his views really that he thinks that actually this is a bit of a myth and it's perfectly possible if you budget well to afford to eat well. Um, we had our child food insecurity stats which were published yesterday showing a doubling in children's food insecurity over the past 12 months now affecting 3.7 million kids. Uh, we had a story we've had more stories from Cantor on food inflation and the fact that this still isn't going down. And we've also had a story about tooth extractions showing again that this is the reason for hospitalization, the, high, the biggest reason for hospitalization amongst children between the ages of six and 10 years old and costing the NHS about, uh, well, I think it was 50 million a year or something. I mean, decent amount of money. Um, if you think the amount to extend free school meals is about 500 million, that's 10% of that, you know, there's, that's the sort of gives people a bit of a sense of benchmark. Um, so, We've talked about national food security. To what extent is um, not being able to afford the, to buy the food that you need in Britain linked to that national food security? I think we tend to sort of put these entirely different buckets of policy making and conversation, but there are connections, right? How would you how would you describe how they link? Well. Uh... I think we have spent 70 years designing a food system that is predicated on producing calories cheaply. Uh, and that means that for most people, uh, the sorts of food uh, that are most easily available on a tight budget are ones that are largely calorie rich and nutrient poor. We only grow, as I've said to you before, we only grow a third of the fruit and vegetables in the world that we should grow if everyone were to eat five a day and have a healthy diet. And because we don't grow enough, they're more expensive. So we've kind of designed a food system where a healthy diet is a luxury. And of course, when you then have a food system that's also designed to be fragile because it's based on long just-in-time supply chains and therefore it breaks, uh, prices go up, availability goes down, and you end, end up in a this shocking cost of living crisis that we're living in at the moment. And so more and more people don't have the money to have a, a, a luxury diet, a healthy diet, and to eat things that will increase tooth decay, increase the risk of diabetes and health disease, uh, uh, and, and diabetes and uh, diseases associated with uh, overconsumption of calories and poor diets. So the challenge in the long run is to change change the food system to both protect people and make healthy diets uh, more affordable and unhealthy diets perhaps less affordable and less available uh, and to ensure that the food is produced in a sustainable way. That's true food security over the long mm. run. It's not about keeping shelves full. And of course, that has the social implications that if food is actually from an environmental and health perspective. And as you said, if you tot up the environmental costs of our food system in terms of the greenhouse gases and the pollution and all the rest of that, if you tot up the packaging costs, the you know, the broader pollution costs, the transport costs, the healthcare costs, the loss of biodiversity costs, and all of the rest of that, actually our food system is very expensive but we pay for it in ill health, we pay for it in social mm -hmm. support, we pay for it uh, uh, in just general taxation. And so I think our challenge is how can we make our food system better while supporting the people that need the support? And as food prices go up and we have conditioned people to expect to pay very little money for food, uh, and, you know, we... As a society, we lock ourselves into expensive housing, which we could talk about at length, you know, uh, contracts for cars, contracts for mobile phones, contracts for Netflix, etc. The amount of money that we have to spend on food, we've conditioned ourselves to expect, expect it to be a small amount. So when prices do go up, which they will increasingly, people have nowhere to go. So we need to do much more about building the system that allows everybody, and I mean everybody, to access a healthy diet. And that, you know, somebody said to me in a meeting the other day that, you know, 
only the rich people um, can afford to eat tomatoes anyway. So what is all the fuss about? This is a middle class bubble tomato gate. And that is shockingly true. And, you know, we're privileged enough that we can afford mm. a healthy di di diet, but that is completely inequitous in, ma in many ways. And, you know, these new stories just highlight it. And I think Lee Anderson's approach that you ca can have a healthy diet on a budget is only true in a very, very, very small part of parameter space. Yeah. If you've got a kitchen, if it's well equipped, it, you know, I have a knife you know, proper chef's knife that probably costs a hundred pounds that I use for chopping fruit and vegetable. And therefore I can make a lentil dal, which is very tasty, relatively cheaply, but I can do that because I've spent hundreds, hundreds of thousand mm. pounds of getting a home and learning the skills and all the rest of that. So the fact that it can be done by some doesn't mean that it can be done by everybody. Yeah. And, and, you know, the levels of social inequality are just horrendous, as, as the Food Foundation has shown in so many ways over the last year or two. Mm. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm going to pull out one quote from what you just said. We've designed a food system where a healthy diet is a luxury. Um, the challenge is how can we redesign it? And obviously um, it's good that uh, the Labour Party is giving this some thought, obviously, by the comments that Keir Starmer made. I'm hoping too that the current government will use the time it has left to do a little bit more in that direction. Um, thank you all very much for joining. A huge thank you, Tim. It's been a really interesting conversation. If you have not come across our podcast yet, this is a shameless advert for it. It's absolutely brilliant. Please do listen in. The link for it is in the chat. And we'll close it there. Thank you all very much for joining. And um, the recording will be available online for anyone that wants to pass it on to colleagues. Thanks again, Tim. See you soon. See ya. Thank you, Anna.